if we could have quiet, please, for the start of the lecture. Thank you. So, if you haven't yet collected the five handouts from the front, um, please make sure you do collect them at some point. So I should say, all of the handouts will be available from the module webpage. So if you do miss anything, you can always get it from the module webpage. And assuming the technology doesn't fall apart, which it could do at any time, uh, there will also be some form of video recording of every lecture. Well, uh, screencasting is what I think the official term is, um, where we'll be recording what appears on the screen um, with synchronized sound. And I'll try to make those available for every class uh, on the web page as soon as I can. I'll also make annotated slides available, um, so whatever I write in the lectures will be visible later in a static form as well. <laughs> so this is the first proper lecture for mathematical analysis, and we'll be starting chapter one. Now, it's changed quite a lot since Dr. Zacharias last gave this module, which was back in somewhere around 2004, or was it 2003? Anyway, there have been quite a lot of changes since then, but I must acknowledge that uh, he did originally write the notes for this module. I've made various modifications. So there are lots of definitions and theorems, and most of these are printed in the printed notes, but most of the proofs and the explanations of the examples aren't in the printed notes, and I'll be writing those, maybe not all of them, in lectures. <coughs> and maybe some of the ones I don't do in lectures, I might do more examples in the examples classes. So we will do, we'll cover a lot of examples in this module, and you can't understand the theory without understanding examples, and how the theory applies to the examples, and how the examples demonstrate the theory, and the various concepts in this module. I recommend filling in the gaps in the lectures as I do, even though I'm expecting, technology permitting, to be making the written notes available later, but I still recommend that you write them yourselves during the lectures. There won't be too much to write because most of the stuff is already printed. Having said that, there's something to be said for writing out for yourself the statements of the theorems and the statements of the definitions, because if you never write them yourself, maybe, they won't, maybe you won't quite appreciate them as well. So perhaps in your additional time and remembering that you've got three hours a week of contact hours, but you've also got three hours a week on your own, to work on this module, one of the things you could do is write out some of the definitions and proofs, you, uh, definitions and statements for yourself, just in case that helps. So, as I've said, I'm hoping to be able to produce annotated slides and uh, audio and video from the lectures. We'll have to see whether technology uh, lets me down or whether it works. Now, occasionally I'm going to want to tell you something and say, OK, this bit won't come up in the exam. Now, that's going to be rare in this module. Almost everything I say or write or do is going to be examinable as bookwork. And even if it's not examinable as bookwork, it could still come up in the exam as relevant to something else. Um, because the unseen parts of exam questions, anything goes. So the more you already know, if you go away and read some around the subject, read a bit more in books or something like that, the more you already know, the more likely you are to already know something that will help you with an unseen part of an exam question. But as I've said, quite a lot of stuff is what I call examinable as bookwork, can come up on bookwork parts of exam questions. Anything can come up. But if you're looking to make sure you're on top of the book work, then this uh, abbreviation NEB is a sign that this particular aspect or this particular bit that we're doing is actually not examinable as book work, but is interesting anyway.
You can find more information on the module information page, and you can also look at the module feedback page um, maintained by the school, which has got lots and lots of information on uh, past exam papers and comments on student solutions. And feedback on common errors. And some of the common errors you'll find are common errors from year to year. Which, given that I make uh, available this information on what the common errors are, it would be nice if those particular common errors became less common. So please do look at the list of common errors that I make available from the uh, module feedback page because uh, it would be nice to make those common errors into rare errors. So it brings us on to chapter one, an introduction to d-dimensional space. Now a lot of the stuff we're going to do here is pretty much revision. I want to establish the basic notation. I'll give you some alternative notations as well. So I'm using, actually, little d gets used for two things in this module. It gets used for distance as well sometimes. But often it gets used for the dimension of the space we're working in. So we'll be working with r to the power d, d-dimensional space, which means you've got d different coordinates, and uh, the coordinates are real numbers. So you're getting d to pause. <laughs> and you already know quite a lot about these. Uh, I'm not going to distinguish between r to the 1. One dimensional space is pretty much the same as r, so we won't really distinguish those. In theory, you could say, actually, it's vectors with one element in, and so you need a pair of brackets. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that. As far as I'm concerned, r to the 1 is the same thing as r. r squared, two-dimensional space, r cubed, three-dimensional space, and so on. Move up to higher dimensions. Well, you didn't do that much in four-dimensional space and beyond, except for solving systems of linear equations and working with matrices. You did some of that. Now, here's a quick reminder about set notation. I want to point out that for us, zero is not in the natural numbers. Different lecturers, this may vary. Different books vary. I think it's a 50-50 split in the literature. People do not agree whether zero is a natural number or not. So, in this module it isn't, and it's rather important to know that because otherwise you're going to keep thinking I might be divided by zero when I'm not. For example, that's going to come up straight away in a minute when we talk about the rational numbers. Um, I'm going to be dividing by things that are natural numbers. You want to be sure that's safe. Well, zero isn't a natural number, so we won't be divided by zero. That's in this module. So when I say zero is not a natural number, I say that's for us. So that's in G12 man. So Z is a set of all integers, positive, negative, or zero, whereas this um, called blackboard bold, these funny, um, these funny symbols. So blackboard bold Q, the rational numbers, that's all the possible fractions you can make by taking any integer you like and dividing by a strictly positive integer. And I found people get confused about that, so make sure people are all right. I found that uh, in the exams, when I've asked questions about these things, it turns out that people are still confused about this notation and have mixed up Z and Q. So do make sure that you know which is which, because otherwise it could spoil an entire exam question for you, or at least a part of one. Real numbers, then, is blackboard bold R, and the non-negative real numbers R plus, but I don't care whether you put the plus at the bottom or the top, and I'll probably forget and put it at the top because I do that sometimes. Uh, when Dr. Zacharias wrote these notes, he put the plus at the bottom. Um, but you're allowed to put it at the <coughs> top if you like, no difference, and I'll probably be a bit random whether I put the plus at the top or the bottom. It's still R plus. Um, that's the non-negative real numbers. Notice that zero is included. 
So as you can see here, this is half open interval notation. Zero is included, infinity isn't. Infinity can't be included because infinity isn't a real number. Um, you can actually have plus infinity and minus infinity. This infinity is the plus infinity version and it isn't a real number so it couldn't possibly be included in an interval of real numbers. In a moment actually we're going to have an alternative notation for an alternative notation for half open intervals. I may use a backward square bracket that sometimes help. If I use a backward square bracket, that's the same as a, a round bracket. It again tells you that that endpoint is excluded. So this is uh, alternative notation. Okay, that's all pretty easy so far. Here's something else that has given trouble in the past. Specifying subsets of a particular set. You want to select just some elements from a particular set. So, again, I accept two different notations for exactly the same thing. You can use a colon instead of a vertical line, I don't care. Just run out of room to the right there. You can use a colon instead of a vertical line. It's just an alternative notation for the same thing. And of course, you can actually work out exactly what this set is, which we'll mention in a moment. But what I want to say is what you see on the left tells you where x is what possible x we're going to consider <coughs> but we don't know exactly which of them we're taking yet and then on the right we have the conditions on x So from here you can tell that we're going to be getting a subset of the real line because on the left it says we're only going to consider real numbers x. On the right it says which real numbers we're going to consider. And it's those x which are <coughs> satisfy x squared smaller than x. And you can do a calculation to work out which x satisfies that and find out exactly what that set is. The second one is similar. The fact that it says x in R tells you that it's going to be a subset of the real line. We're going to be taking some or all of the x's that are real numbers, but nothing else. Then on the right hand side you say which ones you're going to consider. Those ones where x squared plus 1 equals 0. Well actually there aren't any, so put those together and you find that that's actually equal to the empty set. So the second one is the empty set. The first one turns out to be those x's which are strictly between 0 and 1. You could do a little calculation to check that. So what does that tell you? It means that there may be lots of different ways to get the same set or to describe the same set. But if you're asked to specify a set, you've got to use correct notation. A lot of people have lost a lot of marks in mathematical analysis exams because they've been asked to specify a set and they've written down something that didn't mean anything. Either the thing on the left-hand side didn't tell me where the, set was, the x was supposed to be or sometimes people have sort of said x comma y on the left-hand side and I don't know whether it's x or y that they want to be considered. Um, you've got to use correct notation. Now the letter doesn't have to be x, it could be y, but you shouldn't write 
x comma y on the left, I mean, with no brackets or anything, otherwise I won't know which thing you're specifying. So try to make sure that you use set notation correctly, otherwise I'm just, I can't give marks in the exam for things which I don't understand. Um, if you can't express it correctly, then I can't give you the marks for it, unless I can actually guess what you meant, in which case I might be able to give you some marks for it. So what does it mean to say that a set is a subset of another set? In this module, I use this subset or equal notation. Some people use um, the subset without the equals, but I find this is the least ambiguous of them. This means that every element of A is also in B. That means that A is a subset of B. So B might have some things that aren't in A, but A doesn't have anything that isn't in B which you could do in logical notation, <coughs> you can say that if x is in A, that implies that x is in B, which is what we got there. A equals B, that's the same as saying A is contained in B and B is contained in A, which means that if x is in A, then x is in B, and if x is in B, then x is in A. So that's equivalent. You can intersect two sets together. Doesn't matter which way you intersect them, you get the same thing. It's those things which are in both sets. Now, when we're defining sets, you're allowed to use comma to mean and. So this comma here, this means and. Commas don't always mean and. But when you're defining sets like this and, and you find the comma on the right hand side, then the comma usually means and. So it's those things, it's because the comma is giving, you're listing a set of conditions you're putting on x. The first condition x has to satisfy is x is in D. The second condition x has to satisfy is x is in C. Um, and that means that x is in D and x is in C. I'm not quite sure why I put it that way around, uh, but that's those do commute, so it's the same as x is in C and x is in D. For union then, instead of and, you have or. Make sure you know the difference between union and intersection. A lot of people have lost a lot of marks in mathematical analysis exams because they couldn't remember which was which. So do try to remember which is union and which is the intersection. The union, and one way to remember is that a union symbol looks like a U, so that'll, that might be helpful. And the union means you put them all together, and it's those things which are in at least one of the two sets. Now, having done that for two sets, you can do it for finally many sets, no problem. And indeed, you can do it for infinitely many sets, which we'll see in a bit. So if you want to intersect finally many sets, D1 intersection D2 up to Dn, you can use a big intersection sign to say you're intersecting these sets. I is running from 1 up to n. It's those x, so that x is in D1 and X is in D2 and so on and X is in Dn. So again, these all mean and. It has been every single one of the sets. So those commas are meaning and here. They're additional, you're putting a series of additional requirements on x. Whereas the union, those things which are in D1 or D2 and so on up to, or Dn, with a big union sign from i equals 1 to n of the di, it's those x which are at least one of the sets.
which we'll see again in a moment. By the way, the annotated slides and audio from past year's lectures, um, you can find quite a lot on the lecture note on the web page. You can find audio from previous years, you can find annotated slides from previous years, and you'll see you know, quite a, a lot of resemblance to what we do this year. You won't find any video from previous years, so that's new this year. Does anyone have any questions on what we've done so far? I'm quite happy to take questions in lectures, or at the end of lectures, or by email, or you can drop in during my office hours, or whatever. Um, I'm always happy to see that people are taking an interest. However, most of the stuff we've done so far is pretty much revision. But it is important to clarify notation and definitions, as we'll see a lot in this module, and as we'll see in, uh, in the special sessions on proof, if you come to those. Set difference, which is not symmetric. If you do C and take away D, so this backslash here, that's C take away D, those things which are in C and are not in D. Which I can draw a little diagram of. Here's C and here's D. Then C take away D is this bit. And as you can see, if you do D take away C, you're going to get a bit on the other side, which is rather different. Complement is a useful space-saving notation. A little c at the top means I'm going to look at those points which aren't in the smaller set. Now usually we'll be working with taking complement in the real line or complement in r to the d. And that's what we're almost always going to do. So we usually You usually take a set A contained in R to the D and then take the complement A complement equals R to the D take away A in this module. In fact, I think that's all we're going to do in this module. When you move into third year, you'll have a more abstract setting and you may take complements of sets in other sets. And, when you, and that's something else you do in probability anyway. Um, but since we almost always work with sets and their complement when you're working in R to the D, you can expect that to be the general situation. So this example here, it says, an example of a complement of a subset of the real line. This gives you a chance to see what sort of sketch I'm going to draw for things. So I'm going to take um, <coughs> so we consider A to be equal to closed interval naught one contained in the real line. Um, so uh, that's 
0.1, closed interval 0 0.1, that's x in R such that 0 is less than equal to x is less than equal to 1. The complement is everything else. But just to see clearly what the complement is, I'm going to draw a little sketch for you, which will be a useful type of sketch. It's the sort of thing you can do. So let me draw the real line. The real line, of course, extends infinitely in two directions. So let's make that clear. With these dot, dot, dots to show it goes off to infinity. Let me pick out an important point, naught, and another important point, one. And now, I'll do the set A in blue, and I'll use these square brackets to show that the endpoints are included in A. So this is the set A. A complement, then, is everything else. And I'm going to use round brackets for this. I find that easier than reverse square brackets in this situation. <laughs> So a complement has got two bits. The round bracket shows that the endpoint is excluded. So here's one bit of a complement. Here's another bit of a complement. Not sure why yet with this tablet screen. Every now and then it suddenly draws a line between the last two points I pressed. Um, if I can master that, it's going to save us a little bit of time. But for the moment, you may occasionally see an, a, random, a random long straight line appear on the screen, which I will then remove and carry on. So a complement is exactly equal to the union of two sets <coughs> minus infinity up to zero endpoints excluded together unioned with one up to infinity <coughs> endpoints excluded um, or in our alternative notation That's using our alternative reverse square brackets notation. And there's a settle its complement. But you can't always draw things so easily. You try sketching what the rational numbers look like, or the complement of the rational numbers, and you'll find you're just trying to draw an infinite number of dots on the real line, um, and it's not very easy. Nevertheless, I will be drawing those dots, well, not infinitely many of them, but I will be drawing lots of dots on the real line occasionally to illustrate the rational numbers and the irrational numbers. Again, any questions about what we've done so far before we move on to Cartesian products? Okay, Cartesian products then. These have caused a lot of problems in the, in the past as well. There's this notation, there's an x in there, a times, but it doesn't mean you're going to be multiplying numbers together. It's nothing to do with that. It's not that sort of product. Cartesian products are to do with taking one-dimensional sets and putting them together to make two-dimensional sets, or putting various, uh, putting various sets together, taking their products. Take your product of two lines to make a rectangle or a square. So, you specify your coordinates. You put restrictions on your two coordinates and you say the first coordinate A has got to be in, uh, your first coordinate little a has got to be in a particular set, big A. And your second coordinate little b 
has got to be in your set big B. And so you get these two restrictions. That comma again is telling you that you've got a list of restrictions and you're restricting A to be in capital A and B to be in capital B and this time you do have an A comma B on the left hand side but only because I've got brackets around it and it specifies a point. If I left those brackets out and said A comma B without those brackets it would be nonsense um, because I wouldn't have any idea what the set you meant. Um, would I be looking for a set of A's or would I be looking for a set of B's? Would, it wouldn't make any sense to me. However, with those round brackets in you know I'm specifying points where the first coordinate is in A and the second coordinate is in B. Of course two points are equal if and only if their first coordinates are equal and their second coordinates are equal. And if you do R cross R, well that's really just the same as R squared. It's a set of pairs where the first point is in R and the second point is in R and so you've really just got R squared and as we all know, a point of R squared is a point of two dimensional space. So there's your point x, y. x is the x coordinate, and y is the y coordinate. And that's a way of visualizing it. And typically, that's how we'll think of things in this module if you're doing Cartesian products. That's just one point. It's a good idea to know how to uh, sketch Cartesian products of sets, though. So let's have a look at what happens if you take a Cartesian product of uh, two intervals in the real line. And I'm going to let you have a go at this, just to give you a two minute break and a chance to chat to each other. <coughs> Suppose your set A is a closed interval 1, 2, so endpoints included, and a set B is a closed interval 2, 4, with endpoints included, then, and you want to sketch A cross B, well that's going to give you some shape or other in two dimensional space. So you should sketch this and try to indicate whether the shape you get, whether the boundary of that set is included or excluded and think about what would happen if you use different kinds of intervals. So I'll give you a couple of minutes on that and then we'll see what people came up with. So let me just um, give you a couple of alternative ways of writing that before I find out what you've got. So A cross B, as we know, it's equal to those points A, B, where A is in capital A and B is in capital B, um, which is the same as those points X, Y, which may be a more natural way of thinking about it here, where X is in A and Y is in B. So x has to be in the closed interval 1, 2, and y has to be in the closed interval 2, 4. So is anybody uh, willing to tell me what, uh, just give me a brief description of what that shape is? <coughs> anybody want to tell me what that shape is? There's a rectangle, um, which is two high and one wide going in the appropriate places and the boundaries included. <coughs> Let me uh, so put this other thing in here. Oops, here we go again. So it's x, y so that 1 is less than equal to x is less than equal to 2 and 2 is less than equal to y is less than equal to 4 because that's what the restrictions are. Uh, 
and we can draw that easily enough now. So what do you have? Let's draw the x and y axes. <coughs> this probably won't end up to scale. Uh, right, so x is between 1 and 2 inclusive, y is between 2 and 4 inclusive. So here are our four corners. <coughs> so the rectangle, 2 high, 1 wide, boundary included. If you want to show a boundary that's excluded, I normally uh, dot or dash the boundary. But in this case, the boundary is included. It always helps to just say anyway. Um, then there can't be any misunderstandings. So you can get quite a lot of interesting shapes by doing uh, Cartesian products, you can get rectangles, vertical lines, horizontal lines, points, and various unions of those, though not all. Um, but there are some things you can't get, and you cannot get anything round, and you can't get certain other kinds of shapes, and you can't get 45 degree angle lines, which is the sort of thing we've got here. So. Let's see if I can sketch these sets for you. Um, why don't I leave that as an exercise for you? Um, S is a right angle triangle. <coughs> and R is a circle, not a disc. As an exercise, um, sketch these sets. <coughs> so you should be able to sketch those subsets of R squared. And then on a question sheet, you'll get a chance to think about proving that you don't get a, uh, uh, th these aren't Cartesian products. That means you have to prove that no matter which sets A and B you try, that Cartesian product won't give you the right set. Which if you think about it, is not, it is a little bit of a tricky concept. You've got to prove, you, know, you, you look at it and you say, it doesn't look like it's a product. How do I prove it's not a product? There's lots of different ways. There's one way on one of the question sheets. It's not necessarily the only way. You might want to think about how easily you could write a proof that neither of these two sets actually is a Cartesian product of a pair A and B. That means you have to prove that whatever A and B you try, it gives you the wrong answer when you take A cross B. Any questions on what we've had so far? As I've said, I found that people do find Cartesian products confusing, so I would have a good, careful look at that, make sure that you're happy with what Cartesian products are and what they aren't. Okay, now, as I said, R cross R is really the same as R squared. You can take products of three things, then you go to triples, and of course you get R cross R cross R is R cubed, and so on. And that's, uh, you're going to take products of lots of things, 
Well, if you want a rectangle, that's a product of two intervals. Um, if you take a product of three intervals, you get what you call a, a, well, a cuboid, because it doesn't have to be a cube, a re or uh, also known as a rectangular parallelopiped, or however you pronounce it. Um, so that's a product of three intervals. If you take a product of d intervals, you get a hypercuboid in d-dimensional space. And uh, we're also going to call those D cells, and we'll see more about those later. They're particularly nice subsets of R to the D, where you just put a separate restriction on each coordinate. So, what is R to the D? Are we dealing with points or are we dealing with vectors? Well, I'm not going to make a distinction. I might treat things as vectors and add them together. I might treat them as points and say, here it is. Um, some people want to be more careful about whether things are points or whether they're vectors, but I'm going to blur the distinction. You have to understand in context whether we're treating it as a point or as a vector. Now, these points or vectors or whatever will be denoted in the printed notes using bold symbols like this. Um, bold X, bold Y and so on. However, I'm not very good in handwriting at doing that, so I'll just use underlined things. So handwritten. In handwriting, I'll just underline the letters, X, Y, Z, and so on. <coughs> because otherwise, well, you won't be able to tell the difference if I try to show you bold handwriting or, or unbold handwriting. And they're in R to the D, so they've got D coordinates each. You could write them as column vectors. Actually, I'm not going to do that very often. Apart from anything else, it uses up a lot of space. So I normally think of, uh, I normally think of these things as column vectors, but uh, they do take up a lot of space. But a bit of elementary revision from linear mathematics. You can add your column vectors by adding them point by point. So you add the coordinates, first coordinate, you add the second coordinates, and so on. You add the D coordinates, the D coordinates. You can multiply them by scalars. Our scalars are real numbers in this module, not complex numbers. So if I talk about scalars, then I just mean real numbers here. So if you took some real number lambda, You can multiply your vector by that. And that means you have to multiply every coordinate by the same number. <coughs> but you can save a bit of space by uh, writing them the other way. And some people object to this because it looks like I'm adding two points together. But because I'm not distinguishing between points and vectors, if I, if I write this, I'm obviously treating them as vectors, and so I'm adding them up coordinate by coordinate. So I add the first coordinates, add the second coordinates, and so on, in the usual way. And sometimes we'll want to take an inner product this is the inner product that you'll have met in linear mathematics. It's just the dot product. So if you take the dot product of two vectors, I've made it look quite horrible there, but it just means take the dot product, multiply the first coordinates, multiply the second coordinates together, multiply the third coordinates together, multiply the corresponding coordinates together, and then add them all up. So you add, the, you add the product of the first coordinates to the product of the second coordinates to the product of the third coordinates and so on. It's just the ordinary dot product. And corresponding to that, 
is something called the Euclidean norm, which is the usual notion of the length of a vector that you get by using Pythagoras' rule, summing the squares of the coordinates and then square rooting. So you're really using Pythagoras' rule here. Now this is revision of a li little bit later on in linear maths perhaps, so you might not remember it as well. So what's this norm of a vector? That's what I call the norm of x. Or just norm x. For short. If I say norm x, in this module I mean the Euclidean norm. So we sum the squares of the, of the coordinates or of this vector, and then you take the square root at the end, and that's what you expect from uh, Pythagoras' rule. So we'll finish off this chapter next time and uh, possibly move on to possibly move on to chapter two if we finish early.